Hello everyone, today we talk about imperial ideology in the 12th century Western Empire. Um, we talked a lot actually about Holy Roman Imperial history uh, properly meant when it fell within right, the, the boundaries of, properly, of this dominion. But as we will see today, um, not much swang from, from a for concrete point of view, but surely during the 12th century were still being defined in a broader sense. Uh, this century is very overlooked because by the 13th, we're at the peak of medieval civilization, everything was already mediated, right? Instead here, there was still something emerging and not being yet defined, right, in terms properly of international balance, of policy of equilibrium, and all these things. And definitely, um, the, the, say, Germany, specifically, especially during the second half of the 12th century under under the reign of Frederick Barbarossa was the greatest power in Europe, right? Uh, it would, for the, you know, it was, um, uh, it was a temporary situation because the 13th century sees uh, essentially the disgregation of uh, central rule, if, you know, Germany, which never had, it had really had in practice, um, in its uh, elective uh, profile and, you know, with all the nuisances properly of, you know, the possibility of controlling the world territory, even at launching campaigns of, you know, expansion, etc. This is very, uh, to, to, to properly affirm it, right? We'll see it today also with Barbarossa policy uh, as such. Um, and, and things were very different regarding Mediterranean policy that was definitely the much more profitable one. Uh, for the empire, that still somewhat failed for a series, mostly also of, of unfortunate coincidences, but not only, right? And um, broadly speaking, we never focused on, however, properly the ideological dimension, that is, what was the empire proper, what, what was the purpose of imperial rule, and what were the boundaries of its dominion? Uh, because it wasn't much clear. You know that I fundamentally interpret um, history, um, you know, especially of essentially pre-contemporary history, as the uh, you know the continuation, the, the gradual dilution and eventual disappearance, but still existence of this universalistic idea of essentially military religious matrix that existed since uh, ancient times. It was fundamentally shared by all people, right? Here we're not talking about, you know, the Germans, the, the Byzantines, whatever. Here we're talking about literally all peoples, right? Uh, the Holy Roman Empire was not just about Germany, as you know, in the first place, but properly, um, this is our problem. That is, we sometimes cannot... Uh, read history, but through modernistic and nationalistic interpretations. That is, if you had asked people at that time, you would have said, well, "What the hell are you even talking about?" Um, and we we properly fail badly to realize the nature of universal power. Right? If if you want to rule the world, which was what these uh, powers were ideally aiming at, right? Still, at this time, was still fairly secularized compared to. However, the previous millennia of, of you know, of background, basically of, of deep belief and deep, especially shared universal um, uh, ideas, values regarding properly this this control, this capacity that we could call imperium here in the West because of the of the Latin legacy of it and so much, you know, the effort also of the empire this time was to be exclusively Roman in nature, right? Still because of properly, of the grandeur of Rome, that was the only possible center of the empire and capital in, in the full Middle Ages, of course. Um, and that's another thing that normally you don't think like if you start thinking this was something like a German empire or whatever, that's just 19th century bullshit. Um, but uh, properly, uh, what we lack is, is, is the realization of how, how much synthesis was done culturally speaking at the time, to properly expand and accomplish and fulfill this concept, this imperial concept, which was less distant than than one can can actually imagine that is at the time still the, the idea of reuniting 
fundamentally Europe and the Mediterranean all together what was feasible right uh, history went otherwise as we were saying before but I don't know banally the death of Henry VI prevented maybe the Hohenstaufen to actually conquer Constantinople like it would happen seven eight years later with the Venetians and the French uh, and that is something that properly would have literally as you understand change a big deal um, in, in history um, for to, to this day to come and um, that may have accomplished uh, and it wasn't even over at the time right you know there were other chances for example for uh, a German power to reunite dynastically certain crowns think about the attempts at the struggles over Sicily specifically still in the 13th century between the Swabians and the Angevins um, and etc. And it wasn't over yet because still this empire, as you know, ridiculized as it was uh, in our cultures, especially since Enlightenment, because of the idea that this was nor nor holy nor Roman or empire, all these you know this mirabile monstrum, etc. Um, at the time, it was evidently not the case, right? This could be really a consistent power. Could have led to, as we've seen, a radical, you know, historical. Um, different historical path to what the one we know, but especially it had the means, right? Even in the absence of a of centralized state, um, etc., that seems difficult for us to understand, but properly to control the world. And um, and there is so much conventionality here. You see, people get triggered when you use the term Byzantine. Uh, we made a couple of videos explaining why. Um, contrarily wise to what the purest of history would like to to say, you know, and almost a PhD in this field, I could I could prove you wrong in that regard. Um, in fact, uh, it's not a big deal, right? These are purely historical conventions. Like it's ridiculous, you know. If you if you complain about terms like Byzantine, whatever, like erase from your native language any kind of properly of, of of alteration of actual ethnic names that are present basically in every uh, vocabulary nationalities in every language, right? Ask the French to call the Germans the Deutsche, not the, the Les Allemands, right? Uh, or, you know, it doesn't make any sense uh, by a certain degree. Um, and it's convention. And as convention, however, we have built also certain historiographical views. In the case of Byzantine, of course, it is true. Uh, a myth, a negative uh, stigma has been attached, so we fight that, but we don't get so um, hysterical if we want to simply say Byzantine instead to specify, you know, kind of the medieval Roman Empire, right? Because it, it's kind of easier and quicker, right? I've met people that can't really get, you know, lose their plot, but when uh, this is ridiculous, right? It's That's close to a psychiatric problem, frankly. Uh, it's like the grammar Nazi side of the story, right? You know, it doesn't... An, an intelligent person truly does not matter about these things. It matters about, you know, studying actual history until they die, right? <laughs> Which is definitely much more important than getting these sets of alleged counter-arguments to nothingness, to, to, to pure convention that, you know, properly is empty by definition, but it's also useful practically wise. The same goes for the Holy Roman Empire, um, which at this time was not even called like this, for example. Um, and, and also the myth, for example, that the Holy Roman Empire was founded in 962. We will see today, for example, why that was believed, but it's a historiographical invention. The Imperium was one and only, and that's the, the, the core of the empire. Right, it was uh, like an hypothesis suspending war. It was the glory, the faculty of military power conferred by the deity, since pagan times adopted in monotheism as well, and that would, which every single power in the world was founded on. Right, remember that there is nothing uh, in pre-national statalist times that is not founded as as a political rule, as a purely and exclusively on a religious military principle, right? The worst are those leftists have to say that, I don't know, uh, look, it's easier to kill in the name of, you know, of the Bible than they, in the name of, I don't know, Vodan. Or, are, are you kidding me? The, those cultures was based exclusively on the principle the stronger had the right to exterminate, enslave, and rape, and do whatever the fuck they wanted with the vanquished by divine right. The entire paganism was founded solely on this. And... Uh, 
if you don't understand this properly in why it was done and why still medieval times the idea was fundamentally based on definitely a more civilized view from from you know this mere object because at least it brought in a, a pacific non pacifistic for sure ideology it surely actually helped a, a great deal to catalyze a, a more a, what we can call a civil, civilization for real compared to previous times is exactly still that the imperium the nature of this power this faculty had to properly rule at a level for which its deterrent effect would be able to pacify the world because at the end of the day also uh, you know pagan tribesmen were trying to do that their own way it's just that you know th their moral standards reflected the the impossibility the, the incapacity of doing it because of the circumstances right here things were changing and and also it's very hard as as you know as close of it since as not to reject fully every time explicitly any culturalist interpretation first of all because it's racist secondly because it fundamentally has no historical evidence and third properly it's wrong from from properly militarily wise you know in the art of war that is uh, the greater the civilization the greater the destructive destructive capacities and just look at the world we live now right in and and i know this premise is like saying you know all the time I, I do it for people that do not follow regularly, but to, first of all, the, like if you don't get these things, you, you can't properly even study history, right? Because this is what our academic standards is based on. Like today, these things are known and properly, you know, sedimented, confirmed, researched, demonstrated. That there are not things you can wake up one morning opening YouTube video, which don't norm, like mine, which usually doesn't happen like, you know, in, in, in form of comment and, you know, complaining about the fact this is not true. This is basically what the higher, uh, you know, sap of your uh, academic civilization has produced so far. And the fact that you still do not know these things is a serious problem about lots of things that go seriously wrong. Not much just from an educational, properly from a familiar, from a, you know, cultural point of view in our communities. That's a completely different thing. But never think you can interpret history with your own current, uh, you know, mental patterns without proper research and background and something that can last, if not a lifetime, at least years, right? It would be even less, actually, if, you know, we, we started, in fact, with with right foot, right? You know, but we don't, and therefore we need to, you know, school the masses in ways that is 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 problematic at the point. You know, you need to properly teach them things like civic education, democratic culture to understand this concept, which I'm sure many people will also mistake for some kind of, you know, Nazi fascism because that's the level of moral disorientation. Um, but uh, yeah, that's these are the broader problems that we pose ourselves when we talk history. So answering the question of what is the empire by the twelfth century, ideologically speaking, what are its boundaries, what are its its you know, what is deal, right? It's very complicated. Um so we can't do it in a single video. Today we focus mostly on, on these broader prerogatives, bas basically in, in in relation with the church, um in uh, properly in also other um lay powers, and also from a geographical, but I'd say better, territorial point of view, right, properly it's dominion, where, where, where were, what were the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, that, remember, in this sense, also, you see the Byzantines made the, the legalistic question, right, the empire is, it wasn't much mat about the matter of recognizing an empire, but whether it was Roman or not. That was actually the main debate on it. But um, that, it's as if, the, you know, the the romanity of the empires, if the, this empire could be colored in one or in another, is what the, the same um, uh, Germanic empire would fundamentally do uh, try to, to to get as a as a higher prerogative because they knew they they hadn't formally that romanity or at least well this is also debatable by certain standards, but um, in practice it it's you know it's um, probably overrated as a problem right the. The, the the real the, the fidelity to the imperial concept is that you rule right uh, if you rule say better it's exclusively because god wanted to right so uh, this could take especially you know in, in the west there was a great debate on this um in in spite of the fact that christianity was 
um, much more, um, you know, friendly, right, to to her to to uh, earthly power than, uh, say, I don't know, Islam, for example. Um, but it, it was in here for other reasons also. One of the factors for which the West managed to emerge with this capacity of debating and always seeing a double threat, let's say, in, in all questions, political, religious, social, etc. But the core is properly what the Imperium meant for these people. In my opinion, um, when historiography debates these topics, obviously it's very, you know, uh, sometimes it's very literal. That is, obviously history is made on sources, and these sources tell, you know, very fascinating things that we'll see today, but they are also somewhat mm, a narrow base, right? You know, here we are seeing fundamentally um, imperial, anti-imperial sources, you know, pamphleting against each other and rem remarking things that are somewhat understandable in that specific context, but, you know, given their background, right, their, you know, wh wh who were these sources, right, even just look at the people, think about how, you know, the ratios of literacy in this society, etc., you know, we are, in my opinion, overlooking what the broader uh, religious, anthropological view of properly of, of power in general was for these peoples altogether from, from before. Right, and it's also remarkable, for that matter, that in spite, you know, we need always to criticize this was kind of a weird empire by a certain degree, because it doesn't resemble properly the nature of empire, at least as we've structured it in the Victorian term, not much because of the nation state, but properly in, in the sense of, you know, a, a single country that dominates constantly on others, right? This is not quite the case in the Holy Roman Empire, right? There is definitely a German preeminence, which is difficult to deny, but still, you know, could they control fundamentally the Italians? Could they control the Bohemians? Most of the times, they didn't. But most of the times, they didn't control, like no German king ever controlled the world Germany, for that matter, right? And that's probably the most important aspect of it. But once again, this national bias is not important. The important is how much power they effectively had. And by the 12th century, as we've seen, they had actually a pretty big one for international standards, a massive one to say the least, and it would maintain it for, for, for some time. Um, and, but probably, aside from what the facade, what, from what the official for sources, the formalities, etc., um, the, the, the same fact that this empire existed in the first place, that it had survived the disgregation of Car the Carolingian, Carolingian power that had been revived along these patterns, etc., was still you know, is still the proof that people truly believed, not just in in properly the the religious military dimension of, of it, which was most this, you know, sacred legitimization, as we've seen from, from politics and institutions, but properly from like a universal point. They they people understood the need of rule. Uh, they were interested in setting its its boundaries, its prerogatives, uh, and making it work. Because this is what we have, we forget most of the times in the Middle Ages that these people didn't have, surely, what we have today in terms of central institute, centralized states of, you know, firm control. It wasn't a stable war; it was a, a different one, uh, a difficult one to control altogether. But for this reason, they were working like hell for making essentially what we will have today. I mean, do kids that go to school today are taught when they study? the Middle Ages, you know, what happened with the revival of Roman law by the Bolognese school during exactly the 12th century, what was the role with Frederick Barbarossa in the broader pub today? Do, do they understand the magnitude of, the, of this, the, the scale of the impact in Western civilization of the revival of Roman law, the juridical studies of this? Of course they do nothing. They do not know nothing. They think it's just paper or, you know, parchment still largely at this time and letters and boring stuff and they just like to, you know, go watch uh, videos of guys beating each other in, in armor and say, thinking that that's the Middle Ages, right? And I, this is being told from a, from a military historian, so I can't afford to say that. Um, and, yeah, and that's where the problem starts. So I hope that starting, you know, you know I started specifically a new series about medieval Germany and medieval Italy to stress this um, 
th this important connection, this important dimension of the empire, the imp so-called imperial lands, in all their you know exception and peculiarities and un unicities. But let's say, uh, let's go step by step. Um, so when Bishop Otto Freising wrote that Lothar III, for example, was reigning as 92nd ruler since Augustus, right? He evidently intended to portray this, you know, venerable monumentality, you know, historiographical perspective of the Roman imperial rule that, in this sense, had supposedly descended linearly up to the German kings of the time. Um, so this would be normal for a medieval mindset. If you had asked an average inhabitant of the empire, that, that is, where do you live? The, the first answer would have been, I, I live in the Roman Empire, right? And my my king is like, yeah, we're Germans, like we're, you know, yeah, we're, we're Lombards, we're, you know, things like but the, that. But that guy there embodies the empire, the Romanian development, the, the Pope sanctioned it. But more or less, they would, like the average guy would reason along this pattern, this line. Um, and consider at this point even banally, Germany was still called Eastern Frankish Kingdom. It's just under Frederick Barbarossa that started to, you know, to mutuate a, a lot of things from the Western Frankish Kingdom, including, you know, this resurgent, you know, proper idea of Nazio. So um, Germany, um, the, the the Taudans, that this was the names were started being adopted. But as we were saying, also the Holy Roman Empire. And in and even later of the Germanic nation for for a situation that had changed considerably at this time, not in favor of the empire, frankly, and this retreat the retire retreat uh, apparently just into the more the Germanic dimension, um, at least intentionally, because as we've seen, the base was fundamentally German, uh, is also eloquent. So always be careful about titles and names and officiality, because this is a very important indicator. Um, so uh, they saw no discontinuity with the ancient Roman rule, mm -hmm. and you see th here there is properly a, also uh, a monarchic ideal because Augustus was like with the same approximations we do with the Roman Empire, right? It's not Augustus was the first emperor. The imperatores had always existed. The imperium is something that you know it was much you know older than that. Um, Augustus was at best a princeps as an innovation of the politics and institution of the time, but still, you know, as a monarch, what you see, Otto Freising would look uh, upon him like, you know, the guy that fit, you know, the, the monarchic model that existed in Germany also at the time, and identified his continuity, so you understand how the, the semantics are shifted towards, you know, certain ideology that also we, by studying these sources, these medieval sources, we say, ah, you see, so it's already, in empire equates emperor, not necessarily, Right, not necessarily. And the imperium is something detached from the people who own them. That is, you know, these people have to earn them because God has to invest with them. But, you know, the imperium can be properly also held by, as as you know, like it was in by the Roman magistrates, could permeate also other other peoples in a way. So the in this case, the Romanity, the Germanity, uh, was a very boggy ground. That is to say, yeah, it was being invented at the time, in in a sense. Um, but it's sedimented historiographically as this invention. So in, in, in the 12th century especially, this mm, ideology of imperial rule as especially a personal right of governance and justice, which the king exercised in, in these three kingdoms, um, was being properly developed and mm, uh, acquiring a, a greater consistency, a greater form. Right. This goes. In p why did this happen? Because, because as we've seen, the Hohenstaufen were managing now to finally carry out what normally German rulers hadn't managed up to to, to that point. It is to properly a monarchic scale, right, uh, and beyond, of course, uh, over Italy in the outer lands of the empire, Bohemia, Burgundy, as we will see in a while. For with certain specific political and strategic ambitions, um, that had to clothe, uh, had to be clothed, say better in order to, to, to be legitimate. And emperors, uh, considered this time, uh, fundamentally, they had lost the struggle for investitures. That is, they had maintained their prerogatives of bishop appointment in Germany, but not in Italy, so the papacy is already prevalently in their 
you know, as we'll see in the mitigation of their power. Um, and uh, they took their own imperial prerogatives in this sense very seriously. For example, Lothar III, Conrad III, and Frederick Barbarossa in turn referred to, um, you know, to properly, respectively, here we find Nostra Imperiali Auctoritate. Uh, imperiale Auctoritate and Imperatoria Auctoritate to confirm the rights of the monasteries uh, respectively of Minx, Münster, Volkenroda and Wessobrunn. Mm. And the Imperium was thus conceived as a protective legal authority of the king. Right? Then a sort of autocratic potential of such jurisdiction was again made apparent by the Bolognese school of Roman law in the 12th century was in this sense patronized by Barbarossa. These law Bolognese lawyers had advised that the imperium was the, in principle, uh, limited only by divine and natural law. This was actually important to stress because uh, at the time, they, the, basically the average um, juridical practice was, with juridical theory, um, was recognizing the fact that there were certain uh, divine rights, which the same church, in fact, would uh, found its own canonic law, that is to say, uh, the, the use divinum was thought as properly what the church had to embody by itself and therefore what was in parallel to the imperial one. And this reflected, think about, you know, also with still in tradition in common law, it is that uh, people had some rights that preceded um, the, the imperial rule, right? And that the, the empire had as its task to actually only defend, not to, um, not to, you know, control... Uh, to to, meet, to to change to modify, um, and um, the and the same Barbarossa was aware of that. So it's, there is nothing strange when uh, he um, uh, he um, he said, at least in Germany, that there are two things by which our empire should be governed: the sacred laws of the emperors and the good practices of our predecessors and ancestors. And we neither desire nor are able to exceed those limits. We do not accept whatever is not compatible with them. And um, then he wrote, uh, so you see, uh, there is the actual awareness that there is a, a double threat here. There is a sacred imperial law, right, that intervenes to protect, to control. Uh, but the others are fundamentally good, pride, the customs of the, of the people mm -hmm. had to be protected in this kind. Um, according to the author uh, Riven, um, that was Otto of Freising's secretary by way and continuator of the same bishop's biography of Frederick Barbarossa, um, the imperium was cultivated as a protective judicial authority, right, as a constant emperor's concern, right, and he was said when he was traveling the lower Rhineland in 1158 that he uh, quote, let no days pass in idleness, thinking those laws in which he had not made some enactment to advantage of the empire for the preservation of law and justice among all peoples. That was the reason why he had so consistently striven for so strong an empire on this side of the Alps, had calmed the spirits of such strong peoples by great discretion without warfare, and was now regarded not as the ruler of the realm, but as father and governor of one home, one state." So there is naturally this uh, figure, uh, almost a fatherly one, that controls the, the world uh, in, a, in a protective fashion as well. Where, however, he is deeply, you know, loaded in responsibility for he has to act properly in this regard. Um, so the the Imperium was interpreted, uh, you know, and endowed in this sense with the power. One of the two swords mentioned to Christ at the Last Supper. Right, and as such, uh, the empire was interpreted in medieval times as being the needed defender of, of the church. So Frederick Barbarossa expressed himself uh, the idea in 1170, uh, which still at the, at the moment in which he was fundamentally at, um, you know, uh, in contra in more than heavy concert with with the papacy, with Alexander III, to stress the fact that he was still being obedient. You see, in, in their mental frame, uh, even in, when they were actually fighting militarily with the papacy and its allies, you know, still they believed, quote, it is the duty, this is his words, of imperial majesty to provide for peace and justice in the empire's affairs according to the established laws and canonical decrees, and above all, 
for the Church of God by whose intercessions and prayers we hope to be advanced and to reign more confidently in the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, so there couldn't be anything outside this view, right? The, the emperor was le- legitimate even when he fought against the papacy if he was claiming to do that in order to protect the papacy. R- reality was quite different in the sense that, of course, they had different ideas respectively what the papacy in the empire should be. But still, uh, nobody dreamt of eliminating those two elements because in all the, even in the harshest struggles, the struggle for investors, whatever, uh, the two things never came less. They were self-legitimizing each other at the end of the day, covering each other's shoulders in in different circumstances and still developing to these, you know, different fields of competence that they, they battle over but that still were factually controlled by them in a way or another and that, you know, also by, you know, tradition being like that, uh, a, a balance could not be eradicated from one day to another, right? Even when, you know, the emperors marched on Rome, still the papal state was something, still there were lots of, of powers back in the papacy and so on. So uh, it was never over. It could never be over because that level of central absolute control was, was never there. So, um, for example, when Henry IV and Henry V uh, emperors were considered enemies of the church, uh, the papacy is still considered imperial protection of religion as the normality, right? Uh, this, in the we're talking about the harshest time of the struggle for investitures, and uh, this included the specific guardianship of advocacy of the papal see of Rome, um, and still, naturally, as you understand, it was a different interpretation and scopes and limits of this advocacy depending on whether you were papal or imperial. And it's not just a matter of the courts. Here, this struggle produced an incredible response throughout all Western Christendom in terms of, you know, who was right, who was wrong, right? And this uh, stimulated important reflections on power, also in other countries, right? They were not formally within. As we've seen, it's also even difficult to tell what was within the empire or not, but by approximation, we see this German, uh, Italian um, axis, we could say. Uh, so, uh, Henry V, uh, Emperor and Pope Calixus the the Second, had essentially uh, made peace by 1122 with the conquered date of Worms over the questions of episcopal election and investiture of ecclesiastical property, as we've seen, respect in different ways, respectively, in Germany and in Italy. Um, so, the defensive duty of the imperial sword could be resumed with property, specifically at this point. There was also another more, mm, say, properly strategical mm, connection between papacy and empire, in the case especially when the papacy was threatened by other powers. For example, Roger II of Sicily, right, or the Roman commune existing uh, f- between 1143 and 1155 that had basically kicked out the, the, the Pope. And that's basically the main reason also why Frederick Barbarossa had descended in Italy the first time, and like, you know, the Milanese question was actually more uh, problematic. Um, but um, the, mm, properly in this sense, the, the emperor was called to protect the papacy. Also, uh, I mean, obviously from a military point of view, but with some, you know, playing on, uh, with the papacy playing on, in this sense, on the interests of, of the German emperors, that had always aimed, as you know, at, and, and they would manage at a certain point to basically collect dynastically also the lands of, of the empire, once of southern Italy, the kingdom of Sicily, that was, by the way, a papal um, uh, fief, fundamentally. And... Lothar III, Conrad III, and Frederick Barbarossa were called all to perform these tasks differently, in spite they had they would also fight against papal armies. In 1149, Conrad III assured Pope Eugenius III that um, whatever the you know the, the 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 threat or vexation to the Pope's person and the Roman Church, they will intervene. He will intervene uh, because of the Roman Church says that we are appointed the defender by God as emperors. So that was a primary task, and that's obviously what a Roman emperor does, right? You know, he protects Rome and the Church of Rome. So, uh, at Constance, in 1153, at the convention between the Pope's legates and Frederick Barbarossa, who were, at this point, you know, uh, in fact, negotiating with the terms of, you know, the, the, em- the 
the would be emperor at this point because he had still to be crowned in fact in Rome and th- there was all a, a great deal and his mm, his uh, campaign in Italy the, the next the next year uh, Frederick committed himself for this reason to preserve it and to defend quote the honor of the papacy and the secular properties of Saint Peter as the devoted and particular advocate of the Holy Roman Church. Always remember that by this point the uh, the, the popes had already uh, not just a consistent territorial power but properly also endowed it with a proper you know le- legitimizing character, nature, or the fact that it was legitimate for the church to own this property and, you know, properly as a territorial power, right? Not just in terms of, you know, the church must have some, you know, physical place to store its its wealth for the, the ecclesiastical administration. It was properly a dominium, um, a patrimonium rather meant as such, which makes you understand why, you know, they, they, they considered properly something as their own. And this was complicated because the, the popes considered this patrimony as something properly distinguished from any other earthly power in itself, right? Whereas the emperors tended to see it as fundamentally part of the Italic kingdom and therefore falling into a territorial sphere of competence of the same emperor. Right? But the popes was never like that. It was something um, ultra-terrene, right? Um, Naturally, when you know these prerogatives, this uh, especially defense of, of the emperor or the papacy, etc., was accepted as fundamentally the German emperors had you know greater military power than the popes, not necessarily a, a greater political one. That was the problem. Uh, this connection could turn into you know into a m- much more consistent threat. For example, when in 1159, Frederick Barbarossa. Um, you know, was struggling, you know, with the schism that had opposed to different popes, right? One of which he was backing, right? He um, was proposing to settle the matter uh, at a council to be convened under his own authority at Pavia in um, in 1160, in the early uh, year. Um, and Alexander the Third, Pope, was informed that quote, since we are obliged this is from the emperor, to protect all churches established in our empire, we ought so much the more readily to provide for the most sacred Roman church because the care and defense of it are believed to have been more particularly committed to us by divine providence. Um, and the bishops assembled at Pavia actually uh, would mm, essentially... Uh, declared themselves in favor of the anti-pope Victor IV against the Pope Alexander III because the first was much more favorable to the intervention against Sicily that the, the papacy was pushing for. Um, therefore, uh, it was not univocal that the church would approve also papal inter- um, imperial intervention in, in, in papal matters. Consider that the plenitudo potes- potestatis, that is, plenitude of power would be achieved effectively by the papacy only in the 13th century, right? And also not surprisingly so, because it was a moment of rapid decline of, of, of imperial power and a rapid rise, in fact, of papal one a, as a response. Also, you know, and, and therefore it's the, the, the papal political institutional uh, juridical prerogatives would be boosted and even territorial positions made in Italy at the expense of the empire and so on. Um, and uh, so it was, however, still impossible to circumvent the real presence of the German emperor and his representatives as protectors of the Holy See in the patrimony of St. Peter. In the 13th century, the Pope would try to do something similar with, with the French, but still uh, with an ambiguity and without any formal recognition in this sense because the empire was still the empire and everybody was recognizing it in this way doesn't matter how harsh the struggle between properly uh, the two powers right and it was normal it was like the sun and the moon that was the metaphor usually employed as we were saying before there is the problem of 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 territory that is what is what was properly part of the imperium from a border point of view, because you, you understand that this is almost a nonsense, as the, the Imperium manifests itself over over communities, right? We, it, it's much 
more in, in, in earthly yes on, on earth so on some surface physically speaking but first and foremost as as this faculty of power right so when we speak of territory properly meant from a geographical point of view um at the time they didn't even reason like that today we do because we have satellite maps uh, ever since we're we're little we, we see uh, you know maps of of countries with territory defined borders whatever at the time probably nobody cared strict to sense so that is to say territorially speaking there were certain very concrete pertinences but the boundaries floated but especially the control on them floated so it wasn't even important about having that territory but controlling it which was a challenge and more than else you know it was about you know, who recognized whom there right it's always a matter of political support it's still today true right today we don't have states that literally control as some external powers to, to the communities, the territory, right? Some kind of mysterious man out there actually having the power. We still own it, right? It's just that we're much more limited individually to change it. So, But at the time, it was very different because matters could be taken in people's hands at the local level much more easily, right? And uh, it was even counterproductive to hope to, to make a head through uh, at some point. Um, this is important because... Uh, as we were saying before, German emperors didn't properly control Germany, right? There were certain areas of Germany that, especially in the northeast, that nobody quite cared to 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 invest military. Like, like it, it would have been a waste of time. There were a few resources. Uh, there, there were these entrenched powers that regarded those lands as, you know, their, their private business, etc. And you know, other countries were somewhat more profitable in, in that regard. Uh, Italy in particular was very fragmented and very rich, so it would be naturally the target for it, and also for borrower strategical reasons uh, for, for that expansion. So there is nothing strange about that, and that's also where the imperium properly manifests in its universal way. But it's not just about that, right? It's not just about Germany, Italy, uh, Burgundy, and Bohemia that will focus, especially at the end. But there was a general understanding, as it would be normal in the case of the empire, it had it also as it had been essentially as a legacy of the Carolingian one, not of the same Roman one, that basically all countries in Western Christendom would fit within it, right? Uh, you know, we we say the German Empire, it, it's inaccurate, right? At the time, um, they they used it maybe because they reflected the, rea the realities of the rule, and as we've seen, not even fully. But it wasn't considered properly, even a in a political and strategic way like that, because it would have been too limiting. It would have said, you know, it is just a German empire, where's the ecumenic side of it, right? Um, and the emperors, in fact, exa would push it mostly for, for this in latter interpretation. Uh, for example, there is a letter from Conrad III uh, that mentions France, Spain, England, and Denmark as adjacent to the empire in, in this geographical sense. And as if always they, 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 they kind of fit, broadly speaking, into the sphere of influence. Otto Freising lists France, England, and Hungary in the same way. Uh, this is important because the empire naturally maintained very close bonds with these countries. And, uh, well, okay, we mentioned Spain before. Spain was far away, but in the 13th century, you know that there would be even a, you know, a, a king of the Romans. It was... Uh, uh, king of Castile um, and it wouldn't be strange even up to the modern age that I don't know French ruler for example could be elected uh, I mean that had the right or the possibility to be elected as emperor because in theory the emperor was universal in that regard um, there is also an interesting uh, you know about properly the view of, of how f and consider also this the Germany in itself was very um, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it it's by itself was kind of without boundaries, right? There, there is not properly a defined border in Germany, um, with France, with Hungary, with the North also. Uh, it, it's also this massive Central European uh, country that even at the time was barely starting to take a proper national, you know, in the Latin sense of the word, at least shape. Um, and that still was dramatically inter, you know, uh, intertwined with the, 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 the politics of these countries. There is an interesting letter of 1155 by, uh, to the, by Frederick Barbarossa to Pisa, the city of Pisa, uh, where the emperor praised the peasants for terrifying the people of Asian Africa by land and sea, uh, 
right? Therefore defending, quote, the borders of Europe within which we occupied the seat and domicile of the empire. This is fascinating because it's not only highlighting the fact that the peasants were, you know, fundamentally they had swept the Western Mediterranean together with the Genoese of the Saracen presence in the previous centuries. They 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 basically were the the commercial the, the naval power rendered the Crusades uh, possible via sea. Um, that they were still storming, in fact, North Africa, the Near East by sea. That they they had they had heavy commercial interests in there, but properly that they were def defending the borders of Europe. That here is considered not just as one, interestingly enough, but were exactly the dom is indicated as where the domicile of the empire fundamentally stands. So Frederick would see Europe as fundamentally at least the seat of the empire as such, which doesn't say you know we control factually all Europe, but it's where properly the our imperium resides which is also interesting because uh, you know it doesn't automatically cross out the byzantines but those still are however in europe and you know w what was the relation with them that would be also an interesting question so you see there were different communities that historically had been framed under the control of the empire we have named i don't know hungary think about the importance of the battle of the lech and how fundamentally it was in it fit in more the Western orbit, in spite of the also the influences of the Byzantine Empire, Denmark, that traditionally had even Christianized to escape, you know, the German expansionism back in the day, uh, France that still had had important struggles and kind of competed in the area with uh, with the with the Germans. Pisa also was a maritime republic, like. Um, you know, it wasn't much way often to, to control these cities because they couldn't blockade them from the sea. But uh, this power, for example, was traditionally Ghibelline and uh, kind of backed um, imperial power to secure, for example, the interland, whereas living more, you know, freedom to expand maritimely speaking, which was played on by the emperors because that didn't threaten this uh, eminently territorial dimension which they were uh, exercising and they needed them for the crusades. So all these kind of interesting influences and as if properly the empire stretched all over this and without much of a defined territorial border right so the imperium was conceived largely as a sort of terrestrial authority permitted by god for the discipline of of the nations right um and uh, there was a firm idea also compared with you know you know, drawn from from biblical books, mainly from the the one of of Daniel, for example, that um, gave proof of this. You know, the the the, the consequence, for example, of, of some of the ancient empires, eventually to Rome, and from this to you know the, l the last empire before the the coming of Christ, that it would have been the uh, at that point the the sole holder of the imperium once his reign uh, would have come. Right. Um, so this was seen you know, there are authors like Rupert of Deutz, the, the suburb of Colin that was Flemish in origin if I'm not wrong, that all concurred to also to to strengthen these prerogatives. Uh, even if, as you understand from from a merely from a merely ideological standpoint, not much with um you know uh, with a sort of you know of for you see, um these well were often important men. Right, but sometimes it was just a work, a literary work that would inspire other uh, elites to, to write like that. Maybe it didn't even matter in certain environments, right? Whereas, you know, somewhere juridical sources were more important, etc. So, but everything was potentially used to concur to this power would be uh, used. Um, Otto Freising properly saw an eschatological. Uh, and national attach. He said that German kings would be the, the, imperi the imper imperium holders up, up to the judgment day. So he saw properly this, um, you know, G German dimension of the empire. Um, and this would have been sanctioned definitely, albeit it was already existing de facto, according to him, by the reception of the title Imperator et Augustus at Rome in 962 by Otto the Great, mm -hmm. which is interesting because normally Augustus was also, yeah, he was uh, coupled with the Imperator as such, right? Whereas, you know, still the Imperium could be held by also different others. And this is interesting. 
uh, because you know that Augustus is a sort of uh, majorative, it's the, the idea of a venerable almost uh, figure, you know, right, a superior one, uh, as as the person properly, as at least the office per se, and um, and 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 uh, according to Otto Fries, and quote, and thus the Roman Imperium was devolved upon the Germans, right, and that's where also the idea of the Holy Roman Empire that begins in 962 in Rome with Otto the first is, but as a matter of fact, this was uh, a creation ex post, if you, if you realize that. Never to underestimate, however, the, the great effort from the side of the Ottonians to properly stress the Romanity of the Empire, which is something that the Germans themselves didn't like much, because they saw it more in an ethnic fashion, even in a sort of you know, contemporary way towards what had been the ethnic Romans. Instead, uh, their uh, higher level was all a concern of important international um you know competition that's so um naturally the um uh, you know the, the the necessity to contend properly the romanity of the title to especially to the byzantines but also in areas that were kind of more directly roman right as rome the papal states Italy all at large also living strongly with a with a higher concept of public authority that was stemming from roman law its revival but the roman legacy uh, altogether, uh, in in general, um, so the, the at the end of the day, the imp Roman Imperium was conceived as the uh, the dominion over the Christian kingdoms, but virtually all over the entire world. Also, consider what was the word for these people at the time, right? They had a precarious knowledge. They knew the yes, more or less, there were other countries, other continents, etc., out of their reach. But uh, their geographical understanding or even practical necessity of doing it uh, were a completely another thing. Uh, in 1137, uh, Vibald of Stablo expressed the idea that Lothar, uh, to, to, to Lothar III, actually, when he wrote him, quote, For justice amongst all the stars, uh, it is certain that the sun rules in the first place in the heavens, so the Roman Imperium indisputably surpasses all the powers in the world. This is interesting because it shows how it was objectively recognized there was some other power out there that, after all, God, for some reason, had maintained these other powers around. It was the same problem that affected the Byzantines, in a sense. That is to say, if you're a Roman Empire, the Comanic Empire, par excellence, but do you control everything? No. Do you control all the for, you know, former lands occupied by the empire? No, e even though it's a name to reconquer them. And consider that the 12th century saw a significant expansion act under the Comnenian dynasty, also in Italy and in in Rome, in contention to, in fact, the German Empire, in competition with it, uh, etc. So it is <coughs> really a matter of... Um, uh, you see, uh, of seeing a perspective, but also a, a realism behind that. That's all why also the uh, the idea of Holy Roman Empire is being received, uh, you know, historiographically in an ambiguous way. Not because at the time they didn't properly focus on what the reality was, but rather because uh, it doesn't m m uh, properly reflect the after after all the accurate realization that the Imperium is not by definition universal. That is to say, God has the universal imperium, and he provides it s single rulers with, right, so uh, this idea that still, yeah, it was, there, there, there was no united empire like in Roman times to cover the world world, but that fundamentally, th and that there were at this time still other powers, it w was accurately accepted and observed and realized, right, if anything in front of, uh, internationally at that point in Europe was even, the Mediterranean was even, that it it couldn't be uh, something, you know, it, that you w they would ignore, right? Otherwise, uh, also the same competition, the same claims here would have not had had a, a concrete grip. Um, so, the, yeah, and the possession of the city of Rome was the other major big deal, right? Uh, Rome herself symbolized a universal dominion, uh, the German princes received letters in 1157 from Emperor Frederick Barbarossa explaining that, quote, by divine and provident clemency we hold the governance of the city and the world. Right? Remember, that holding Rome was holding the world. And there was probably no better 
factual sanction than that to prove the the actual imperial power per se, right? And especially in its Romanity, in this broader Western legacy, in that regard, consider that it's not as few in in this perspective also. Comp- I mean, in front of the Byzantines to be able, as you know, the German Germanic emperors uh, did have the upper hand on Rome most of the times, right? Rome was still, by the 12th century, like the papacy as such, was looking still at the East um, as a viable option, fundamentally, um, uh, for reviving imperial rule, and still we'll have to look how the, the papacy played very cleverly and was happy to manage the idea of two empires, right, because it could mediate and, and ag- aggrandize its power between them. But objectively, Rome was more of a Western reality framed into the Holy Roman Empire, and um, and as such, because you see, when, for example, before we mentioned the Roman Commune that kicked out a pope. Well, the problem there was that the Patrimonium Sancti Petri as such, uh, considered by the popes, was such in in its materiality, but um, as long as its spirituality could keep control of it. So, obviously, when the Romans uh, created uh, their own commune in a land that the emperor, in this sense, you know, know, as such, they they didn't believe to be properly... Uh, you know, uh, ecle- you know, ecclesiastical as such, and because they were organized as a lay power, secular power, they, they were essentially, you know, the emperor said, you know, we, we should also control properly the city as such. Right in that occasion, actually, the emperor intervened in favor of the papacy, etc. But in previous times, the problem had been posed. That is to say, uh, you know, the Church of Rome and the city of Rome are two distinguished things. Just like in in the broader Christianity, the the Christian Church and the Christian Empire are two different things, right? So it's not uh, banal as a realization, also because the Patrimonium Sancti Petri was finite, right? And in spite of broader claims of power that were already made since Charlemagne's time, since the papacy had more like kind of an an Italian horizon, right? The, the greatest demands they did at least up to this point, I think, were fundamentally up to the uh, Adige River, right, and so up to Sicily f- fundamentally. So basically, the whole peninsula of Italy, um, which they, the, the papacy never controlled, but factually, in 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 their from from their perspective, you know, the Sicilians were their vassals as a creation group. Um, the um, uh, still the central Italy was largely, at least, uh, you know, informally under papal control. There were disputes with the emperor in certain areas of northern Italy, like where would, that certain legacies, certain inheritances belonged to, etc. But fundamentally, there was, a, you know, an important connection uh, to, to the idea of an extended power that the same papacy was striving for, for obtaining from a concrete point of view. Um, but the same popes, at the end of the day, defined the emperors as lord and uh, of the city, meaning Rome, and the world, right? Lord of the world um, was, um, you know, was never adopted actually as a, by the imperial chancery as a, as a title, but it enjoyed s- some fortune in literary currency because the 12th century was a great century of uh, re- revival of, of universalistic ambitions, right? Uh, political compaction was proceeding faster, right? The same... Um, the German Empire, as we've seen, had this, you know, important projection capacity uh, and possibility, properly, even in reuniting East and West, namely. So, uh, these ideologies were very purposeful and useful, in fact, when, you know, you realize the enormous international competitions, uh, competition, you know, existing uh, between these powers. It sometimes was really uh, transnational, transcultural, and, you know, I was seen with the Byzantines, but even Islam, fit, you know, sometimes shared some ideas. For example, of Romanity, the, sul- the Sultanate of Rome, for example, is a proof of that. In a sense, they they would essentially try to collect the Roman legacy, as the Ottomans later would do. They were Caesars in their title, right? Um, so uh, that big was the Roman legacy, right? And never underestimate. Still, Europe here is is especially the center in the north is is still you know, something very different from the South. The, 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 the main developments, as we've seen from a juridical, political, administrative point, come 
still from the Mediterranean at large, right? They, the, the wave comes from the south. So uh, those lands had always remained with a, ingrained with, with this pretty solid idea of the Romanity of power in a way or another, or at least they, 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 there would be a, a natural resurgency along that the ideology in a time where some statual systems were s taking place and you know some need for some for 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 a previous authority to be sourced to be quoted as uh, in a legitimization sense um were emerging so uh, Vincent of Prague for example referred to Frederick Barbarossa as quote the lord emperor lord of the world's lands which is a hell of a title um the archipoeta who belonged to the entourage of the imperial chancellor and archbishop of Cologne, Reinhold of Dassel, wrote this as it follows in Latin, Salve mundi domine, Caesar noster ave, cuius bonis omnibus jugum est suave, princeps terre principum Caesar Frederice, etc., which stands for greetings to the lord of the world, hail our Caesar, for the good of all his yoke is light, Right, this idea of the the measure, the you know, it was it, these were also all ideologically also Roman virtues. So the words a heavy, you know, classical revival by certain standards. Prince of princes of the land, right? Caesar Frederick. Mm -hmm. This is particularly interesting. Also, the the choice not of, of Rex Regis, as we will see, but of princeps, uh, princeps, principes, right? Um, in front of Caesar, as well. Here, emperor is not is not used specifically, but uh, that's, uh, as you understand, it's not a, a Roman rendition completely, there is something else, but still those were, these terms were used at the time in slightly different ways, and here now we should be a philological inquiry on it, but we don't have time. Um, Henry VI, uh, Frederick Barbarossa's son, we talked about him every once in a while because he's a very interesting figure. Uh, he was eulogized by Peter of Eboli in his Liber Ad Honorum Augusti, which already tells much by the title, that refers to the emperor as Prince of the World and Lord of the World. Mm -hmm. And um, this aspect specifically was um, taken up by the Chancellor to proclaim the preeminence of the empire of all the other powers, right? Peoples, kingdoms, and the Christian world at the time. Um, this is important, as we'll see, for a number of reasons. We'll talk about Sicily in a while, because he was properly king of Sicily, and as he had inherited uh, his wife, as a, you know, the Sicilian kingdom as Constance of Hauteville's dowry, as the last heiress of the Hauteville of the Norman, the Sicilian Normans. Um, and he w he had enormous ambitions, right? Uh, after Legnano, that had s significantly shrunk um, the power of German emperors in Europe, in the Mediterranean, uh, the, mm, the royal marriage between Henry and Constance had fundamentally provided oh, in one shot easy. Um, some, yeah, there was also a military campaign, but it was just dispensing of, as we'll see, of some rebel barons. Um, the simply the dynastic union. So basically, what the papacy had always dreaded is the, the 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 dynastic union of the empire in Sicily. So basically, we're talking about an immense power revived altogether for the, for the time. This were Sicily was also uh, much, very, you know, was one of the most, if not actually the most centralized country in Latin Germanic Europe, right? Full of grain, resources, dramatic, uh, you know, strategic position, you know, capable of tra threatening Constantinople, having, you know, control of the central Mediterranean, so the Straits, I mean, something enormous, right, it coupled with that major uh, imperial land mass and its traditions, its, its system, it was essentially uh, sh choking the papacy. Um, and the, but the, there is an interesting aspect um, that we draw from a diploma of 1174 by uh, Frederick Barbarossa that fundamentally elevates uh, the imperial majesty and uh, clemency of both nations and kingdoms. Uh, and as a consequence, there was a mm, you know a trend, a very interesting one, that triggered a lot of 
a lot of rulers at the time, it was um, essentially designating from the German side any other power, any other king fundamentally as Reguli, that means kinglets, right? So uh, whatever was not the German emperor were sub-kings in a sense, uh, and treated in this, you know, uh, named in this diminishing sense. Uh, but it's important to stress how this form was never used officially because of course it was too triggering as such and um, it wouldn't fit in a diplomatic context for, for good. But there, are, there were authors that made use of this. For example, John of Salisbury, that also didn't have much of a pleasant idea of, of the Germans, as we'll see in a while, reported that Louis VII of France was called as Regulus by the Archbishop of Cologne um, and, uh, and that he was triggered, enraged by that, and also the Chronica Regia Coloniensis, that was a pro Hohenstaufen source, was contemptuous towards the provincial kinglets, right, and peoples, uh, who were supporting Pope Alexander III during uh, the, 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 the papal schism and the clash with Barbarossa. There's also a letter of, of King Henry II of England, who was, mm, you know, in positive terms with, uh, with the empire at the time, and who almost admits uh, Frederick Barbarossa's world authority, and in theory also uh, of, of the Kingdom of England. In fact, he says, We lay before you our kingdom and whatever is anywhere subject to our sway, and trust it to your power that all things may be administered in accordance with your nod, and that in all respects your imperial will may be done. <laughs> right. So this is interesting because at the time, you know, England... You know, Henry II was also a hell of a ruler, right? You know, they um, this time, you know, the, the, the you know the English controlled uh, an important amount of France as well, and um, they they were some of the most effective powers, also properly in terms of central control, um, and um, you know, on their lands they they shared a bit this as Normans with with uh, with Sicily. And there was even a connection sometimes, as we will see now, with the succession uh, after the extinction of the Ottoville. It was so that the English could come to rule Sicily. Then eventually the German connection was preferred. Um, and, um, well, okay, Henry II's letter is very, you know, it's formal, right? He's, ma he's making a diplomatic courtesy to, to a friend. Huh? So um, there was, however, in some environments under you know so the dominion of Henry II, uh, some authors, for example, Stephen of Rouen, who did consider the emperor to be Charlemagne's proper heir, and that in consequence the Capetians had usurped his right to the sovereignty of France, which was naturally a very political ideo slash ideological idea to say basically that. Uh, you know, the France should be ruled by the, by the English in a sense, and that, or better, in this case, by the Germans. But still, in, in, the, the important was taking out the Capetians, right? And also, you understand some what would produce itself as a Anglo-German alliance, also against um, the Hohenstaufen at some point. Uh, and um, so, ideas varied, alliances varied as well. But at the end of the day, um, this you know idea that there was some kind of uh, legitimization based on a, on an imperial um, prerogative, aborigine, uh, right? That um, origin that was mm, uh, properly preceding any other uh, in the conferring of of, of earthly power is 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 quite important because it laid under really any. Like, even when properly the empire was not being considered as such, politically, etc. But, you know, fr from a jurisdictional point of view, for example, people had to say where did this faculty of rule had originated. And this is not just banally, you know, uh, you know to, to point it out. As we've seen before, the, the standard was normally, yes, there was an empire of some sort that normally also kings thought they to have right in their own land. Um, and uh, sometimes directly from God, we've seen it recently also in later times, right, that, that for example, at some point in the time of Charles of Luxembourg, we are in the 14th century, the Polish king um, said that while the emperor actually had to ask 
permission for the papacy to be so. Instead, uh, the Polish king at that point received um, power directly from God, which, you know, at that point is saying, you know, <laughs> the empire is not, well, of course, a lot of things had changed at that point, but still Charles of Luxembourg was a hell of a, you know, of a ruler and uh, with a great factual power even at that point also close to Poland but of course that's the attrition and kind of the, the same um, as we were hinting at before John of Salisbury was literally disgusted by German pretensions toward dominion there, there was some kind of you know national bias as you've seen properly rising um, from you know from from this sense of you know yeah the national awakening by a certain standard Decree. So the idea that the empire would be associated to the German nation was something that would proceed along that pattern. I personally studied this thing in 14th century. Uh, German mercenaries in Italy were uh, the yeah. Th there is a pretty good idea that that the the empire is a sort of national thing for for them. Uh, well, in, his, in, in the 12th century, John of Salisbury wrote, at the time of the Council of Pavia that we remembered before, to Ralph of Sar, quote, Who has appointed the Germans to be judges of the nations? Who has given authority to brutal and headstrong men that they should set up a, prize, uh, excuse me, a prince of their own, choosing over the heads of the sons of men? In truth, their madness has often attempted to do this, but by God's will it has on each occasion been overthrown and put to confusion, and they have blushed for their own iniquity. It's interesting that John of Salisbury here makes this uh, vent, but without actually producing a, a proof about his statement that he's, you know, what he's referring to. Like, obviously in his times, I don't know where this was written, but okay, okay the, the Germans were struggling, I don't know, with the Lombard League, where, you know, were... were Eventually they would lose, so maybe that's a reference to that. The same goes also for the struggle for the investitors, etc. But when I first read this passage, I said, wow, this this could have been written by an Englishman still during the 20th century, right? Between the, 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 the two world wars. Like, what are the Germans to think that they have to rule the world? And in this case, properly you feel the idea, which is, is fair, right? It's also accurate that he used to say, as we've seen, the, the Germans were very powerful in this specific moment in history, especially this half of a century. But factually, as we've seen, they didn't quite control I don't know, the surrounding neighbors, right? France, England itself, not even Poland factually, or Hungary, or, you know, as we've seen, the, the, the factual power was limited uh, in the country, and also England had, for example, a more unitary uh, model in that regard. So there, there are important differences, and the question is legitimate: like, why did the Imperium pass to this nation and not to another one? That is to say, why was this established? Which is also a great historical question in the first place, because you have to explain after the Carolingian, the disaggregation of Carolingian power, how eventually. Uh, you know this this German uh, imperium eventually connected. Well, okay, the the Italian connection is obvious because Rome was there, so there was no other way that the Carolingians had already set the preeminence of the Italian kingdom in that institutional frame. But why did just the Germans, right? You know, why didn't the French or others that at this point were also reaching an important amount of power, power would? As we were saying before, by the 13th century, France would rise fundamentally as the major power that could easily equate, if not surpass even, the German one uh, of the 12th century, while in fact German power was crumbling in, in a central sense, in a monarchic sense. Um, and yet the, the Pope that had favored also the rise and checked, you know, even by a certain degree, also thanks to the help of the same Germans at some point, uh, the French expansionism never developed anything like an imperial authority. Yeah, well, at the end of the 13th, beginning of the 14th century, you know, Philip IV and Boniface VIII had some kind of a problem because the French had developed in these years fundamentally the Caesaro papistic ideal that the, the French king was at the head of the church in his own state. And that's all another thing, but it, it, it still stemmed from a kind of an imperial ideal. Right, and the same at that point, the same German emperors were fundamentally imitating what the French were doing by a certain standards in terms also of their behavior, their you know appearance and ideal, attached ideology. 
in this sense. So it's quite fascinating to look at these swings and the, the related opinions of the contemporaries. Um, so consider, however, factually, the connection of Germany with other countries such as Denmark um, and England or Poland, Pomeranian, Silesia, the, the Council of Flanders were pretty strong, right? Um, they, um, because they, Germany received properly homage from them. So they, um, they were fundamentally picturing how the Imperium was recognized outside of, of German borders. So much, in fact, that the, the Holy Roman Empire at this point was the, constituted by the German, the Burgundian, and the Italian kingdom, as a matter of fact. Um, Lothar III, Conrad III, and Frederick Barbarossa, they wanted to conquer the kingdom of Sicily. As we've seen, that was mostly the deal. And this is the, 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 you know, the international strategic balance in all this is, is insane, right? Uh, I often refer to it um, when, for example, I made a, um, a video about um, Emmanuel I, Comnenus, that at this time was one of the most powerful rulers around. He attempted the invasion of southern Italy, almost wiping out the, the Sicilian Normans. And there is a beautiful book written by Magdaleno that is to be found also in PDF on the internet quite easily about uh, him. And he tells him in very, you know, in detail what the international balance was at the time. And all the problem with Sicily was naturally that it threatened the empire, but it also was threatened by the empire. Uh, I mean the Byzantines, and then also by the Germans who also wanted to conquer it. And it was a, you know, everybody was trying not to become, to make others become too powerful um, and also because you know even the distance mattered right you know conquering these lands uh, was you know a matter of also man managing to keep to maintain control on them and were actual military expedition from the Germans as well in, in all these times for example in 1137 Lothar the um, third uh, avoided confrontation with Pope Innocent the second in process because as we've seen the papacy didn't look uh, very favorable upon this, on this um, you know German invasion of Sicily. But however, because of these generalized problems of decentralization, etc., they invested together, Count Reinulf of Alife, with the Duchy of Apulia. That was also you know it was one of the most important, basically implying a joint imperial and papal lordship over the Sicilian land, something shared rather than, you know, properly formalized as such. It was always ambiguous in this sense. Um, as much as what properly the Germans were thinking to do with this kingdom, because it fell out of the of, of the empire, so uh, if it, had it been conquered, right, how it would have behaved? Well, the thing happened, because William II of Sicily died in 1189, um, and since, as we've seen, Heron VI had married uh, the Constance of Otevide, that was actually William II's own. Um, and, uh, and she was thus the, the, the last legitimate member of the Sicilian royal house, dynastically, uh, claimed the kingdom as his own possession. There was a war, as we were saying before, between Henry and the barons of the kingdom, uh, who had elected the illegitimate royal scion, Count Tancred of Lecce, uh, that uh, was eventually crushed by Henry, who recognized, uh, was recognized by the Pope in 1192 as king. In this perspective, it's interesting to stress how the Alteville had preferred fundamentally a, a foreign dynasty to the local barons. Right, exactly because, and this would be evident in the following history of Sicily, during the this, yeah, this during Frederick the Second, in part at least, you know, with this, um, eventually Henry Premature's death, and eventually the passage and with the Angevins later the Aragonese death. Fundamentally, the the weaker the dynasty, obviously the greater the power of the barons locally, and this is something that, as we've seen, was what the the, the Sicilian kingdom had managed to maintain. Actually, much better than, than any other 
in the West as a ratio, as a balance of power, and that instead would dramatically go, especially to all these wars, in favor historically to uh, in the hands of the barons. That at some point, you, you know, even with the Angevins, especially with the Aragonese, literally the, the kings were installed, but with, with a negotiation with these guys, and, and certain areas of the kingdom would never be factually ruled by by the but the, as it had happened in Norman in, in early Swabian times, right by these foreign dynasties. And so there, there is all a collapse of public authority, of settled system, but it's another thing, so privatized in nature. Um, so uh, consider also the international, like in the 12th century, considering what do we, la what do, do we leave this kingdom to, fundamentally? It's important to make also the, a specific international choice, because one country naturally means a direction rather than another, and this is all to be uh, rightfully thought, and other powers may not be happy of that, so th th they must find a viable solution. So Henry VI was, for this uh, reason, uh, fundamentally uh, in possession of uh, the dynastic power, the Kingdom of Sicily, and uh, since 1194, fundamentally, and uh, he even avoided uh, from there on, the uh, uh, customary homage for it to the Pope. But Sicily was still a papal fief, right? Uh, in at least historically, and the, uh, the there was the, there was some debate about this, mm, as Henry the Sixth himself wasn't considering Sicily as a fourth kingdom of of the Western Empire either. Right, he never made that claim. There was some, you know, it's interesting even how uh, his wife behaved because she felt very much the uh, Oldsville uh, legacy, and she wanted to stress naturally the, you know, the the per the, the uniqueness of of the Sicilian kingdom and its prevailing relations with the with the Pope, etc. Obviously, Henry was making more the you know the role of the German, but as we know, even between the two, there was never between the couple there was never an attrition regarding to this fact. They were just acting um, like that because of specific political needs, right? Sometimes uh, with differ towards different communities, right? Because th this is uh, evident even if you look at the history of Frederick II later on, their son. Um, you know, the, these rulers acted with different faces, literally, uh, depending on the various communities that they were addressing, you know, in a sense. Um, even though they cared enormously for each any, and every one of them. So, at that point, it's significant that Henry VI didn't make a claim for maintaining Sicily, like, uh, as an imperial fief. Like, it would have probably created more com international complications that at the moment, also he died quite early. Uh, he didn't. He wasn't interested to undertake. Um, surely he um, did designate what we can see call as a capital, but which by 12th century standards is not properly correct. But still, you know, this was named as uh, an imperial and, and royal city as well. Mm -hmm. So it was granted that status as a part of the empire proper, but not the whole kingdom. Mm -hmm. So it was very uh, shaded, mediated. Because evidently he couldn't or wouldn't want to do much at that specific moment for his own convenience, and this opened naturally the uh, even more the problem with the with the Byzantines, right? Given that they were the rivals uh, to the claiming world dominion, and even in here relations oscillated between alliance and hostility as as always with any power in general. The Comnenians were definitely recognized by the West as true emperors, right? But the German chancery would be careful to deny the name of Roman, specifically, using some circumlocutions, uh, such as, you know, calling them king of the Greeks or Constantinopolis and emperors. The Byzantines had done something similar with Charlemagne, had recognized uh, the imperium, but n not the Roman one, right? Um, and generally speaking, they were not prone to do it with, with anybody. They hadn't done it with anybody, or at least you know there wasn't properly a um, you know a, an interest to to do so uh, for, from their standpoint. Um, and they were quite jealous of that. It, it's it's remarkable how after all this you know this 
was respected by other powers, even though they used these titles from their own that you know didn't quite was kind of certain passive aggressive, not insulting titles was never quite denying the humanity of, of the Byzantine Empire as it really was. Um, there is under the you know in this time the the general uh, expansion of, as we've seen, uh, the, the, the whole and ideological mm, you know, scale of ambition. Right? He, Frederick Barbarossa, for example, as an emperor, mm, confirmed his desire to take over all military command of the Third Crusade. Mm. Even if things were really not like that, he would eventually die in it, but he, w he was just uh, like a different contingent compared to, to the others. It was not a joint command. Uh, even though he was sometimes recognized by the Muslims like uh, properly the emperor, I don't I don't remember the sources now, but still you know there was a preferential connection. But uh, they, they did the same even with the most powerful rulers would come also with Richard of England and so on. Um, and there is some suspicion by authors like Roger of Howden and Niketas Coniatus regarding Henry the Sixth's uh, ambition to claim universal dominion at that point where with the collection of German, Italian, and Sicilian legacy. And between 1196 and 1197, it is believed, is hypothesized, that Henry was properly about to, create, to, to make an expedition intended to conquest Constantinople herself. Uh, there is no, like, uh, explicit evidence of it, but considering that in seven, eight years the Fourth Crusade would storm Constantinople, well, you would think that maybe something was boiling there. The situation was a bit different because still, you know, the, the events that led to 1204 are less obvious than one may think, right? Uh, they didn't happen, you know, they hadn't properly planned them in, in an intentional way, right? The thing came by they were actually called by the Byzantines themselves because of the, their internal dynastic disputes. Um, however, there is a, a, a German chronicler, is a well-informed monk, Otto of St. Blasian, that thought at that point that Henry VI would have mm, taken advantage of the prostration of Constantinople to subject it to the Western Imperium. And uh, it's also been pointed out rightfully that uh, Henry VI uh, accepted homage from the new kingdoms of Cyprus and uh, Cilicia and Armenia that uh, were, had been provinces of the Byzantine Empire up to a very short time before and that were quite important also for further campaigning in, in the Near East for the Crusade and so on. So overall the picture is, is it, let's say it's not a matter to of saying you know what are, what the intentions really were because obviously if these guys had had the, the opportunity at hand they would have always exploited to to conquer Constantinople or whatever but they wouldn't necessarily uh, have the, the possibility of obviously of saying it out loud also because it would have been kind of difficult even to legitimize in a certain sense uh, but also properly for strategical interests of you know not spoiling the, the, the surprise of things like these in any case it didn't happen. Henry died in 1197, so the thing ended like that, and it opened to, as you know, the minor age of Frederick II. It was a, a terrible thing, because that, that, that sensibly crippled any capacity there of the Orange to really reverse the tide in, in Germany, and to eventually, so much that Frederick would fundamentally govern as a Sicilian ruler, even though he cared so much about Germany, also as a, properly as an emperor, but, but as a German king, Right, uh, but he his policy notoriously was the one of essentially privatizing everything, uh, lending to the princes what they wanted in exchange for the construction of a person territorial domain, especially between Swabia and Austria, to secure the connections with Italy once again, because at the end of the day the objective was creating a centralized Mediterranean empire in Rome or Palermo at best, at least, um, and uh, so. Also, geographically speaking, what are we talking about? Well, since the 30s of the 11th century, uh, the Germanic Empire had fundamentally consisted of three kingdoms. So, Germany, that sometimes was called the Roman Kingdom, because, as you know, the kings of the Romans were elected, um, as fundamentally the title was would be, would be emperor, 
That is to say, uh, they would for they usually were like the king of the Germans and king of the Romans altogether, or in two separate uh, uh, seats. And then, if you were king of the Romans, you could go to Rome and be elected Roman emperor by papal crown. So, hence the Romanity of the title. Uh, Italy that is sometimes called the Kingdom of Lombardy or the Italic Kingdom, or most properly the Kingdom of Italy. Um, and uh, it uh, was designated you know, as this other chunk of the empire by the time of Otto the Great that had subdued it, or at least had you know, affirmed, he had reaffirmed the imperial rule after you know, the post-Carolingian uh, crisis of Carolingian power uh, and Burgundy that was this other kingdom that is somewhat um, overlooked in this balance of power that was really empty in nature right the the Burgundians didn't have much of a uh, you know central power the, the, the royal capacity had evaporated the nobility had taken over right in Italy at least there were so many different city states that it was as if it was filled with you know another kind of strong power on its own Burgundy didn't have even a clear exact physiognomy. It was mostly favored by this, you know, relatively decentralized air compared to other more, you know, political. But it was rich, right? It connected the Rhone, you know, through the Rhone Valley, the Mediterranean with Central Europe. It was, you know, very strategically meaningful in a sense. But it was an aborted kingdom. So much of it would disappear at some point in the later Middle Ages. Um, it's interesting because it, uh, originally, as we often say, it had had even a, you know, a better, a, a more promising start to the same Western Frankish kingdom. It had had its own power. There, there had even been properly emperors from from our, uh, think about uh, Hugo of Provence, etc., in the tenth century and so on. Always connected with Rome in that in, in that sense. Um, especially, in fact, the the southern end. This was known as Kingdom of Provence or Art was mm, somewhat divided from the interland and uh, was a bit more, you know, urbanized, florid also than the most, um, you know, so open to the Mediterranean, so it had a significant strategic relevance compared to the to the north. Um, and the election to the German kingdom validated, as we've seen, the title to other two thrones. And um, that it's, it's recorded that certain... Uh, barons from Italy came to Frankfurt a mine to observe Frederick Barbarossa's election in 1152. So it was still believed, of course, in Italy, it doesn't matter how much Lombard League struggled against the emperor. At the end of the day, that you know, that was imperial land, right? And nobody would discuss that, after all. And there was, naturally, uh, especially a feudal element that was still more in favor of, of the, you know, of the emperor than of the rise of the free communes that were challenging their, mostly the rural possessions and so on. So it was still an actual thing. And in 1085, the title of king had been granted on a personal basis to the Duke of Bohemia as well. Um, in uh, 1158, uh, Frederick Barbarossa repeated the honor for King Vladislav II. Albeit uh, Bohemia wouldn't be permanently accounted as a kingdom and until 1212, when it properly acquired that role, and later on, you know, that Bohemia went on to be one of the major, you know, one of the four lay elect secular electors of the empire. Uh, Bohemian history is fascinating. Uh, they managed to carve the, the, this own power that, especially by the, the second half of the 13th century, would become to be factually the largest in the empire. Before being crushed by the Habsburgs in 1278, um, and uh, it 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 was essentially benefiting from from this situation. It was essentially the most uh, Germanized of the Western Slavic kingdoms. It was properly fitting within differently from Poland, and also well, Hungary, which is not properly Slavic power, but uh, was similar in in nature in this regard, and um, and it maintained its own unity. Right, it's not like Poland that at some point witnessed also the, the German colonization on the coasts, um, or let's say some some kind of you know, attrition. With that presence of some regions that were somewhat Germanized, like Silesia, etc., with the, the push towards the east, and uh, and also witnessing a disintegration of the unit, the political unity of, of the kingdom at some point. Now, Bohemia grew, Bohemia grew, you know, w well, compacted. It it had a you know, a good a good potential, especially 
And as we were saying before, there, there's not properly like a capital at this time, but in mind, there were certain cities that had received within the empire sacred regnal authority, um, especially through uh, the process, let's say, of unction and coronation that, that happened in them. For example, well, Rome was the first, uh, you know, example by excellence, the city par excellence. Conrad III, Frederick Barbarossa, and Henry VI uh, had golden seals with inscribed Roma caput mundi regit orbis frena rotundi. That is, Rome head of the earth governs the reigns of the round world. <laughs> and that was normal because the imperial title was attached to, to the city itself. Uh, in 1159, Frederick uh, described Rome as, quote, uh, as the city, quote, which is the head of our empire, mm. properly, uh, status urbis que caput imperi nostri est. So there was no doubt about the centrality of Rome in this regard, and uh, the prestige deriving from even its control at some point was, was enormous, right? Uh, a few sovereigns managed to, for, for a while, to, to maintain a control in the city. It was very complicated for a number of reasons we, we can't digress now on. Um, and uh, the, during the papal schism of 1159, the same Frederick claimed, uh, you, know, you know, he actually lamented in this sense the threat posed on his jurisdiction on the capital, quote, for since by divine ordinance I am emperor of Rome and I am so styled, I have merely the appearance of ruling and bear an utterly empty name lacking in meaning, uh, if authority over the city of Rome should be torn from my grasp. So he was recognizing properly that also the lack of control in this city would bring to the diminishing of, the, of his own prestige and power. Uh, other cities rose to this, you know, to, to greater importance because of this imperial institutional function, right? For example, Aachen, historically, that was founded as a second Rome by Charlemagne, properly as a palace with, you know, with, with that specific pur purpose of creating a Rome of the north, uh, had remained, after all, a modest city, right? It didn't play these dramatic roles like, I don't know, Cologne or Frankfurt, etc. But it was still symbolically very important. The throne of Charlemagne is there still, and to the, the, the place is beautiful to visit. Uh, so we know that du during the festivities of December 1165 and January 1166, during the canonization of Charlemagne, Frederick Barbarossa claimed the city of Aachen to be a holy city, and the chief of cities, quote, the head and seat of the German kingdom. Uh, a place of kings which as, quote, the royal seat in which the Roman emperors are first crowned, basically surpassing dignity and honor any other city in Germany, right? So Aachen was a sort of German capital in this sense. Um, and other kingdoms were distinguished in a, in a similar way. For example, Monza in Italy was appointed in 1159 is properly the head of Lombardy and seat of that kingdom by Frederick Barbarossa who built a palace there in 1163 uh, and uh, this was definitely done to trigger Milan and Pavia that were also you know they're basically there uh, very close and that had led this Milan especially being the major opponent of uh, Barbarossa's pension policy in Lombardy etc uh, Monza's molar Right, also like next door to Milan. So technically, you know, even for an army that besieges Milan, normally Monza is the, the place. You know, they had the strategic relevance, and uh, he, um, the emperor, claimed that quote, our predecessors were accustomed be to be crowned here in Monza by the law, uh, uh, the law of the kingdom. Right, this was false historically, and the reason why he may have uh, said this was actually the fact that when his uncle Conrad III was elected as anti-king in 1128, well, this had happened there, had happened in Monza, so this might have been a way to re rehabilitate his um, his uncle and the fact that still, the, as the first Hohenstaufen ruler, uh, he uh, would have, um, you know, uh, he, he was a crown in, in Monza, so this was as if, you know, the, the Hohenstaufen had started a new a new tradition in that regard. Um, similarly, Arles was declared the head of Provence, so much that became the principal seat of the empire in 1160, uh, a, one of the, the principal seats of the empire in 1164, um, and it had, a, as we've seen, an important uh, 
role in uh, it was the most important city in in, in yeah in, sou- in southeastern France no doubt uh in this strategic location and Vienne in the interland as well was declared the seat of the Burgundian kingdom in 1166 which also you know is important because between there and Swabia there was the the Zaringa, mm, the the mains that was always in the southwestern corner of Germany this uh, interference let's say with uh, reciprocal interference with the Burgundian affairs right Savoy uh, not necessarily just the French power because Burgundy was considered as something different from France but still so it's a bit complicated but let's say that the, there was an overlapping at some level of the, the because there is a difference between the Duchy of Burgundy and the County of Burgundy that were all around there they were very important territories uh, held by comital rule and um, their control was was very significant also the Habsburgs fundamentally emerged from, from that context later on and yeah anyhow we, we've talked a lot today. I'm glad that we addressed this topic. For now, we stop it here. We will keep talking about these things. Uh, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.